Today's uh, guest speaker is uh, uh, Jude Anderson uh, from uh, Pennsylvania State University. He's a PhD student, and his advisor, David Williams, uh, is here too. And uh, thank you for coming. And uh, he's been uh, working on uh, um, constraint belong image uh, generation in four dimensional space, X, Y, Z, and T, you know, obviously application for space time computations. And, uh, and he has developed methods for hypersurface hypervolume. Uh, mesh generation and he's currently working towards uh, a 4D boundary recovery. Yes. That will get you a PhD. Yeah. Probably. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a talk, uh, yes, uh, talk about uh, hypersurface hypervolume mesh generation techniques for space time application in four dimensional space. So, all right, please take off. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for inviting us um, here to speak to you guys today. It's really exciting to have to be here as I know my professor is. Um, so yeah, hypersurface and hypervolume mesh generation techniques for space step applications in four dimensions. Uh, just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, also, Dr. Nishikawa told me that it's common for people to ask questions during a seminar. So if you yeah. see anything you want to ask me about, just stop me and I'll try and answer it as best as I can. Um, first, we're gonna, gonna go through the motivation of why we're doing this, why we think this matters, what types of problems this can address. Uh, then we're going to go into 4D hypersurface meshing, uh, hypervolume meshing, and some quality improvement methods in four dimensions. We'll also talk about some future work that uh, Dr. Williams and I are pursuing, mainly 4D boundary, boundary recovery, and maybe a few other smaller things we'll discuss. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what each one of these things is in detail in just a minute. So motivation. For conventional CFD methods, uh, there's often difficulty when simulating certain things like moving boundaries, unsteady shock waves, shock-shock interactions, shock boundary layer interactions, um, especially when it comes to high order accuracy. Uh, applications for this include turbo machinery, high-speed aircraft during, during, during maneuvers, um, rotating detonation engines, uh, things like that. So there's got to be, we're looking for an approach to deal with problems like this because conventional CFD methods have difficulty in this area. And what we're proposing, or a solution for this, this that we, sorry? That mean uh, um, yeah. yeah, that would be nice, yeah. right? That's, no. There we go, okay. <laughs> that looks better, okay. So what we're proposing is space-time finite element methods for these. Uh, what this can do is accurately track moving boundaries, unsteady shock waves. This helps achieve higher order accuracy. Uh, so that's the motivation of why we're going into this. Now we're going to go into the detail of how we accomplish this. Now, um, I oh, you just have to click back on the slide, probably. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So first, we're going to talk about 4D hypersurface smashing. So we recently published a paper in the CAD journal uh, discussing this in a lot of detail. So we're just going to give a summary on how this works. If you want more detail, there's a, a paper for the reference. So first of all, what is surface smashing? All surface smashing is is lower dimensional elements one dimension lower than the domain you're considering. So as an example, if you're in the three-dimensional domain and you're dealing with simplicities, you're going to have a mesh of triangles that approximate some CAD geometry. So here you can see we're trying to approximate a cube in three dimensions, and we have a mesh of triangles approximating that. That's a surface mesh. So what about a four-dimensional surface mesh or a hypersurface mesh? It's the exact same thing, except just scaled up. And there's a few nuances with that that we'll discuss. Uh, instead of having um, boundary triangles, instead of that, it's going to be boundary tetrahedral, right? tetrahedral facets that um, form your hypersurface. And we'll talk about how you form that in a minute. This is just an overview. So first thing you want to do for your for any space-time problem is to find your time domain. So T initial and T final. Where are you beginning? Where are you ending? 
and you're not going to mesh that entire time domain in one go. Just mesh it all at once. You're not going to do that. You split your time domain into times, space time slabs. And each space time slabs, each space time slab has three specific parts, an initial plane, a terminating plane, and an intermediate surface. As you can see here in that bottom right image, you get an idea of the three parts of that. The intermediate surface is like the wall surrounding those two planes. So for any space-time slab, it requires uh, a few things from the CAD geometry. We need some prediction of the CAD at time T initial and time T final for TN, TN plus one for that space-time slab we're considering. And we need to know the velocity of all of the points uh, for the CAD geometry during that time interval. So that time interval, it doesn't have to be small, right? It can be arbitrarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make as large as you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for predicting where these points will be, we have a trajectory tra trajectory tracking procedure that if we know the velocity of the points on the CAD geometry, we can predict where, where they will be across the time interval. So we can track them as they're moving through time. So starting with uh, 2D plus T surface meshing, three-dimensional space-time surface meshing. Uh, we'll walk through this example, then we'll move to three dimensions plus time. So let's consider any intermediate space-time slab in our collection of space-time slabs. So any, any inter intermediate slab, in order to form the, the surface mesh on the initial plane of that space-time slab, we will extract the surface mesh from the terminating plane of the previous space-time slab. So we extract that mesh and we create our mesh on the initial plane based on that. So on that initial plane, which is figure two right there, we will identify the bounding, ed bounding edges and bounding vertices in figure three right there. And we can take those bounding vertices and follow them through time through our trajectory tracking method. We follow them through time to form bounding vertices on the terminating plane of the space-time slab that we're considering. Once we have the vertices there, the connectivity on the boundary remains the same. So we can reattach those vertices and form edges on the terminating plane. So we have some sort of boundary on the terminating plane of that space-time slab. So moving on. In order to form a mesh on the intermediate surface or the wall of this 2D plus T space time slab, you reconnect old vertices with their new vertices moving forward in time to create quadrilaterals on that intermediate surface. These quadrilaterals, each of them can be split into four separate triangles by just placing a point in the center of the quadrilateral and splitting it into four triangles. So now we have a mesh on the initial plane and the intermediate surface, we just need a mesh on the terminating plane. So we have bounding vertices and bounding edges on the terminating plane. You can create a mesh on that using any 2D mesher. It, it's that's a very solvable problem. We know how to do that. So we can create a 2D mesh there. All you have to do then is combine the surface meshes from steps two, six, and seven, meaning the mesh on the the surface mesh on the initial and terminating planes and the intermediate surface, that wall surrounding it. So mesh at TN plus one is not just a copy of mesh at TN, but you generate it independently. Yeah, yeah. The mesh on the previous time slide may be refined, oh, right? Okay. So that may be different. And you here you're going to might be making a coarser mesh on the initial plane. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but the boundaries are the same. You just translate extrude those points to the TN plus one. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but the surface mesh can be independently generated. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the final plane, yes. At TN plus oh, one, that's, in the, oh, that's sorry, independently okay. in the, yes. generated from oh. the initial, yeah. So yeah, the terminating planes mesh can be different than the initial plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So how the velocities on the points is defined? So you define from the future conditions or your velocity sometimes can change, right? Uh, it's not a flow velocity, right? But 
Yeah, it's not a it's not a flow velocity. So here we're considering cases where, say, you have turbo machinery, you have yeah. a prescribed motion of the boundary, and you know what the boundary motion is, so you know the velocity, then you can you can use this method to compute the surface mesh. Um, but for two machinery, for example, some of rotated another one with the state and don't rotate it, so that must be zero. Yeah. In those cases, it's zero. In that case, you can just use a straightforward extrusion method. That yeah, yeah. That but here we're, I mean, if you just want to do simple extrusion and you don't have any moving boundaries, then like there's, you don't really need to be using a, a space time method probably. So uh, the idea is that we want to be able to handle cases that have moving boundaries. And, well, the cases with both moving and the stationary boundaries. Yeah, so then for cases that have moving and stationary boundaries, then the method works because in cases where you have a uh, gestationary boundary, it just becomes a standard extrusion approach. And then in cases where the boundary is moving, then you track the trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to three dimensional plus time, four dimensional hypersurface meshing, it's very similar. There's just some additional points that we'll discuss because we're just moving up in a, a bit of uh, complexity. So for any intermediate space-time slab that we're dealing with here in our collection of space-time slabs over the time domain, considering any intermediate one, we're going to extract the hypersurface mesh from the terminating plane of the previous space-time slab, and we're going to use that to create the initial hypersurface mesh on our initial hyperplane or the space-time slab that we're considering. So here you're going, instead of bounding edges, you're gonna have bounding vertices and bounding triangles. So we're just moving up one, uh, one additional element in complexity. So exact same three, same thing, step three, we're going to take those bounding edges or boundary, uh, sorry, boundary vertices, and we're going to project those along the temporal axis using our trajectory tracking method to find the bounding vertices on the terminating hyperplane. And the connectivity from the initial hyperplane will remain the same. So we know our bounding triangles on the terminating hyperplane as well. So if we are going to connect the old vertices to the new vertices moving forward through time, that will generate a series of triangular prisms. And each of these triangular prisms can be split into or subdivided into a series of tetrahedral facets. And that, that, okay, wait, one more step. Mm -hmm. Then we have our intermediate surface mesh, we have our initial hyperplane mesh, and now we have uh, bounding triangular faces and bounding vertices for the terminating hyperplane. So if you think of that hyperplane, it's just a surface mesh in 3D, like a separate 3D subspace. And so you just mesh that using any 3D volume mesher to create the mesh on the terminating hyperplane. So again, you combine steps two, six, and seven, the hypersurface meshes on the initial ter and terminating hyperplanes and the intermediate surface, and you have a hypersurface mesh of tetrahedral facets. So those green stuff, green edges, uh... Um, what are they indicating? It's just an illustration of tetrahedral facets to show that it's not a flat surface um, of triangles. It's, it is actually a tetrahedral. Yeah. Yes. Three, yeah. It's yeah. just an illustration. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That helps. That was the best yeah. we could do. It's, it's hard to <laughs> visualize that. You know, yeah. 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 Try. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So you call it this high hypersurface. It's a surface, but the surface is a tetrahedral degree. Right. Yeah. The surface is a volume mesh in three dimensions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so quickly, triangular uh, prism decomposition, there's a few different ways of doing this. One of the main reasons to show this slide is because you do not want to use A and B, basically. That's one of the main reasons you don't want to do this, because you can imagine, say you have two neighboring triangular prisms, and they're both of type A. You can have diagonals cross very easily, and you have an invalid mesh. So unless you're very cautious, you can easily create an invalid mesh. So we 
we, we show this just for the sake of completeness, but we don't recommend using this. We use option C or E. This will always produce a valid mesh because it can't cross with its neighbors. We prefer C because it has a less entropy drop, but the same number of points. Those are our ideal configurations. E is fine as well, though. So just a few examples. Here we have one uh, three-dimensional space-time mesh, uh, a 2D plus T a surface mesh. This is just a cross that's rotating at a rate of 0 0.1 pi radians per second over a time interval of 0 to 20. So it rotates one full rotation for the mesh is done. And you can see this is turned upright on the right. You can see the cross. It forms this kind of helix as it's moving through time. Mm -hmm. Right, you can see that full helix. It, it's kind of interesting because you can see the entire rotation in one object, right? So there is no exact solution for a cross rotating helix. Uh, there, there's no exact solution for the surface area. So how do we know if we're getting what we want? How, how do we know if this is accurate? All we did is just increase the number of elements and calculate the surface area and it converges. As we increase the number of elements, we know, OK, this is reasonable. So if we're going to move to a four dimensional hypersurface, three physical dimensions plus time. Let's we tried an example, which is a sphere contained within a box and the sphere is expanding over time. So the time interval is zero to one and the sphere's radius expands from one to one point two five. So there actually is an exact solution for the hypersurface volume of this, the object that this creates. So we're able to compare our hypersurface volume, our numerical hypersurface volume, to the exact solution of this, and it converges to second order. Our last example we'll talk about hypersurface meshing are tandem rotating ellipsoids. So the first ellipsoids rotating at the rate of rotating at a rate of 0 0.5 pi radians per second. The other is the opposite, minus 0 0.5 pi radians per second. And over the course of the space-time mesh, they each rotate 90 degrees. So you can see on the left, that's before, right, is after, after the rotation is complete. So again, it's difficult to find an exact solution for the entire um, hypersurface volume. So we compared the final hyperplane, which would just be a three dimensional volume mesh. We compared that volume to um, our numerical results for that volume to the exact volume we're expecting, and that reaches second order convergence. So, so how this uh, volume is defined for the hypersurface? Is the volume of the, of the whole space? What's the volume defined for the hypersurface? The volume defined for the define the volume for this. Just so we consider it as just a three-dimensional object, right? It, for the hypersurface, you just say this is three dimensions. Forget about the fourth dimension now and calculate the volume as normal, right? Because that one volume of this. Yes, the volume of that snapshot in time, that mm -hmm. hypersurface, right? So, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So um, it's possible, as you know, to compute like so. This is like somewhat technical question as well. So like. It's possible to compute the area of a triangle just based on the edge lengths. So like you have like in for the 2D plus 2 example, you have like a triangle that's embedded in three dimensional space and you need to compute the surface area of that triangle and then add that to all that's all the other triangles that are in the mesh. And that gives you the surface area in 2D plus T and in 3D. There's another formula that allows you to compute the volume of tetrahedra based on the edge lamps and the face areas. Um, and then you do the same thing there. So you're computing the volumes of these tetrahedra and just adding them up for the entire mesh. Um, so yeah, that was not immediately obvious how to do that because uh, all the formulas that you're used to for computing these areas or volumes are assumed that the simplex is embedded in a space of the same dimension, uh, which is, Generally not the case when we're doing these hypersurface and hypervolume calculations. Thank you. So we're going to move on to four-dimensional hypervolume matching. You have lower dimensional elements in the four-dimensional space. How do we fill that with four-dimensional elements with pentatopes? 
we'll discuss that here. Uh, we have a pre-publication of a recent paper on this. This will hopefully uh, be published in the CAD journal soon. It's under its first revision. Um, so fingers crossed, we're hoping. Um, there's a lot more detail in this paper if you're interested. We'll go through a summary now. So first, let's define what a boundary mesh is. A boundary mesh is the coarsest possible volume mesh. So here you can see in two dimensions that the top right image is the only points in that mesh are on the bounding box and the inward bounding circle. There's no other points there. Obviously, this is horrible for running a simulation. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> the, uh, the only the reason we have this is it's a starting point for adaptivity. A starting point for adaptivity or for some sort of mesh refinement technique, for example, hybrid Delaunay advancing front, you could start on that there. There's a 3D example as well, where the only points associated with that cube are on the surface of cube. There's no interior points. So that's what the boundary mesh is. And the sort of restate, that's what we're interested in creating in four dimensions. We're interested in creating a starting point for refinement or adaptivity, some starting point in four dimensions. Sorry, sorry so quickly. Um, yes. Is that first mesh that you showed, would the goal be to begin adaptivity on that by running a flow solve on that mesh? Or would you just try to do, you know, some kind of metric that would allow you to do some adaptation before running a flow solution on this mesh because i'm curious to see whether a solver would convert reasonably well on this kind of mesh what i have experienced within the past is using metrics to help um increase refinement yeah so you that correct yeah so most likely for this like you need to have an initial mesh and then you use some advancing front or Delaunay approach to sweep through your initial boundary mesh and then refine it enough so you could actually begin running your flow solver on it. Okay, uh, this yeah, is not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. If you have triangle yeah. elements that are like next to your your circle and they're like twice the size of the circle, probably bad things are going to happen. So yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're correct. Just, just wanted to be sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Very unsafe. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the core of our algorithm for creating hypervolume meshes is entirely based on a four dimensional point insertion algorithm. That point insertion algorithm has to take place in a pre existing mesh. What I refer to this usually as a, a good analogy is scaffolding. As you're building your mesh, you have scaffolding around it, these kind of bounding elements that help build up the mesh, and you remove them after you're done. So what we do is we bound, say we've generated some four-dimensional hypersurface mesh, as we talked about previously. Now we want to create a hypervolume mesh based on that. We bound all of the points associated with that hypersurface mesh by a, a tesseract. And that tesseract can be subdivided into a series of pentatopes, predetermined pentatopes. And so we have some sort of starting space where we can begin inserting our points, then remove those bounding elements after we're done. Also, the point insertion algorithm we use is a, a variation of a well-known algorithm called Boyer-Watson. I'm not sure if people have heard of that. Yeah, it's, it's fairly common. So there's a few different ways to split up the tesseract into a series of pentatopes. There's a, a 22 split, a 23 split, a 24 split. We use the 23 split. I, I believe that's new. But, um, yeah, that's, that's been done before. Previously in the literature, people were hypothesizing that you couldn't do it in under uh in factorial or in a number of dimensions so yeah. that'd be people said you couldn't do it in under 24. we did it in 23. So. yeah 20, 24 is fine as well if you want to do that i mean does it, does it really matter not really yeah <laughs> just more information <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay so now we have some sort of space for our point insertion algorithm to take place it's bounding all of the points we want to insert so one at a time we'll begin inserting our points how does that work so we'll select some point we want to insert, and we will search the mesh to find the element, the existing element that contains the point you're going to insert. That will be referred to as your base element. So now you're going to form a cavity branching off from the base element. 
And what you do to form that cavity is you search the neighbors of the base element moving outward and finding all elements that contain that point to be inserted inside of their circumhypersphere's. We'll explain that in just a minute. But you end your cavity expanding once all of the neighboring elements outside of the cavity do not contain that point in their circumhypersphere's. So Delaunay criterion, I'm sure lots of people are familiar with this. Just to restate it, an uh, element is considered Delaunay if it does not contain any other points in the mesh in its circumcircle or circumhypersphere. Here's a simple 2D example. You can see there's another point inside of that triangle circumcircle. So that's not a Delaunay triangle that can be directly scaled up to a pentatope where we're drawing a circumhypersphere around it, determining if there's any points inside of that circumhypersphere. So something, a, a challenge for four dimensional meshing it, are these determinants, which calculating them correctly can be difficult. We'll talk about that in a minute, but these are very important, these two determinants and calculating them accurately. So this is how we determine whether or not a point is inside of a, a pentatope circumhypersphere. As a note, there's something called an orientation check. And in order for your in hypersphere checks to be correct, you want to ensure that all of your elements inside the mesh you're considering are oriented positively. You can do all negatively as well and then switch how the in hypersphere check works. We, we do all positive elements that way. If the point is inside of the circumhypersphere of a pentatope, the determinant for the in hypersphere check will return greater than or equal to one, uh, or zero, sorry. Zero meaning that it is the point is exactly on the boundary of the circumhypersphere. So a minute, just for a minute, talking about the precision related to this. There's something called shoe chalk floating point arithmetic, which I'm sure some are familiar with. It's a way of accurately calculating these determinants when meshing. Jonathan Shuchak developed this. Uh, 20, 30 years back for 2D and 3D, and it, it's very commonly used. We've upscaled it up to be work for 4D. Uh, basically, what it does is it breaks down those determinants into very basic mathematical calculations. Basic as in adding two variables together, A and B. That's an example. Even adding those together, you're tracking Randolph error the entire time. So as you're tracking Randolph error, you're accounting for it. So you know you're going to get more of an accurate result. Also, in accordance with the shoe check predicates, we also use uh, quadruple precision variables when calculating these determinants. Obviously, this will be a bit more computationally expensive, which is why we've added some sort of tolerance to this. We only activate it when it's inside of this tolerance, meaning it doesn't matter entirely that you're extremely accurate if it's very obviously inside of or outside of a pentatope circumhypersphere, meaning much greater or much less than zero. If you're approaching close to zero and you're kind of, ah, I don't know if it's inside of that, you need to calculate that correctly and make sure you know whether or not it's greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, your meshing algorithm can quickly devolve and it'll become invalid. Uh, we've experienced this ourselves. This has to be accurate within some sort of tolerance approaching zero. So now that we've discussed what the circumhypersphere checks mean, we're returning to the core of the algorithm. Uh, we found our base element. We branched off finding all of the elements that contain that point in their circumhypersphere,s and we have our cavity now. So there's another important thing to talk about, which is that cavity is not guaranteed and is often not convex. Meaning if it's non-convex, when you reattach the bounding facets, the tetrahedral bounding facets to the point you're inserting, you'll re it'll result in an invalid mesh. Meaning you can see here, here's a 2D illustration of that. You can see here's some example of a cavity you, you, you got after calculating the, the checks we talked about. We can see that that highlighted or that dashed line up on the top is not visible to point P, meaning that if you were to draw lines from its two vertices there, they would cross the boundary of your cavity. You'd have an invalid mesh. So what do you do? You identify those invisible boundary edges into these boundary edges, and you identify the element associated with that bounding edge. 
then you remove that element. Once that element is re re uh, removed, you reassess whether or not any of the walls, any of the bounding, bounding facets are visible to that point. If they're all determined visible, it's convex and you can re retessellate that region. So just to add to that, so technically speaking, it doesn't need to be convex, it just needs to be star shaped. So yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, also adding to that, like so in the original algorithm, obviously if you perform it with exact arithmetic, um, then you your this. cavities are all going to be star shaped. Yeah. But of course, you're working in finite precision. So when you do this, you're going to end up with some cavities that are not star shaped and you need to be able to detect when that happens. This is used almost constantly. Yeah, um, yeah. Is, which happens surprisingly frequently. Yes. <laughs> Specifically, this, this happens a lot when you have planes and very defined geometry. If you have random point clouds, you won't need this very much, just a vague random point cloud. It's specifically when you have hyperplanes and things like that, this gets used often. Yeah, yeah. thanks for adding that. So we talked about the method of hypervolume meshing. Um, we'll, we'll just show one example here. We have a hypercylinder test case, which is just a sphere being translated through time, and it forms a hypercylinder. It has a radius of one and a temporal length of four. Uh, we have an exact solution for the hypervolume of a hypercylinder shown below. So this is a three-dimensional representation of what the mesh looks, the resulting mesh looks like. Uh, obviously, we can't see what the four-dimensional mesh looks like. We just found a way of giving an idea of that, which is we can use the time coordinate to skew the mesh. So we have this kind of stretching that happens, and we can get some idea of what our hyper hypercylinder would look like. I think in the image on the right, you can kind of see it almost looks like a sphere moving downward. What color? What do colors mean? Yeah. Colors yeah, so just to help show what the mesh looks like. If, if it was a consistent color, it would just be hard to see. It's just to help visualize it. Oh, so color. Don't There's no meaning yeah. for the color. Yeah. Hard work. Yeah. It's just to make it that nicer. <laughs> yeah. Instead of using, you know, visualize a three D object with, and and with a color indicating uh, time. Yeah. Uh, I guess you could still it's yeah. difficult to. Yeah. That's a good yeah. idea. We actually have not tried that. It. Is a good, we could try right. that. Yeah. We have not, not tried it. Okay. This is just an exploded view, too, because lots of the elements when projected into 3D overlap, and it, it doesn't look like a lot here. But if you mm -hmm. explode each element out, plotting each of its tetrahedral facets, you see how many elements are actually in this mesh. Bit of a coarser mesh on the left, finer mesh on the right. So testing this, we had six different meshes with increasing vertices and elements, and plotting that or comparing it with the exact hypervolume that we're expecting, we're able to calculate the error between the two and it reach a second order convergence as we increase the number of elements. Okay. So now we're going to move on to quality improvement in 4D. Just a general overview, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail. We've developed the, the standard quality metric that we use is the one shown on the right, and it's based on the hypervolume of the pentatope and its edge lengths, and it ranges from zero to one, with one being an equifacetal pentatope, uh, like the, a regular pentatope, the perfect shape, all equal edge lengths. And if the uh, metric goes to zero, that's a completely flat pentatope, the worst possible shape, and anything in between is skewed. So just to give some insight of uh, how this works, the shape of a pentatope is directly related to the shape of its inscribed hyperellipsoid. This, which meaning if you draw a triangle in 2D, the circle you can draw inside of the triangle. And the semi-axes of the ellipsoid are directly related to their eigenvalues, lambda one, two, three, and four. And the ratios of the averages of the eigenvalues describe the skewness of the ellipsoid which is directly related to the skewness of the pentatope. So if we can describe how skewed the ellipsoid is, we describe how skewed the pentatope is. So there's more details on the derivation of this in our paper. Here's a, a general overview. We have three different metrics 
The first one is a ratio of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. The second is a ratio of the arithmetic mean and the root mean square. And the third is a ratio of geometric mean over root mean square. Further derivation, we arrive at the column on the right, and we're able to base our quality metrics on the hydro volume of the pentatope and the edge lengths, which is something that's very easy to access. That's what we want. We want something that's convenient. Data here is super long, so it gets its own slide. And uh, yeah, there's more details on this in the paper. So we can prove that our quality metrics lie within one and zero by considering a hyperellipsoid or an inscribed hyperellipsoid with all non-negative non eigenvalues, all greater than or equal to zero, and we consider a well-known relationship, the root mean square is greater than or equal to arithmetic mean, greater than or equal to geometric mean, greater than or equal to zero. So what we can do is divide out the root mean square, and by doing that, we arrive at some of the ratios we talked about previously. And we'll get that the second and third quality metrics are both bounded by one and zero. If we go back to that relationship and then we divide by the arithmetic mean, we bound the first quality metric by one and zero, meaning each quality metric is guaranteed to lie on the interval zero to one. That's what we want. One being the perfect pentatope, perfectly shaped, zero being completely flat, worst shaped pentatope possible. So now we're going to talk about bistellar flips. I promise I will show how these two relate in a minute. We're talking about two different things. I'll bring them together in a second. What is a bistellar flip? It's a way of interchanging geometric features to remesh a region. Geometric features as in like facets, faces, or edges. The most basic illustration of this is a 2-2 flip in two dimensions. You have two neighboring triangles. Boom, all you do is just flip the diagonal. It becomes two entirely different triangles. That's a two, the most basic flip. In three dimensions, there is a 2-3 flip, getting slightly more complex. So there's two neighboring tetrahedra on top of each other, and they have two uh, isolated vertices that uh, are not connected. You draw a line from those isolated vertices, and from that line, you create three separate tetrahedra that are different from the original two you have. So it's a way of changing remeshing by using combinations of these different flips. And these exist in four dimensions as well. We're going to talk about what those look like in just a minute. <clears throat> One second, my throat's getting dry. Just to ask a question, um, for the tetrahedra yeah. case, you say a 2-2, two, two, you were talking about the 2-3 flip. Is there, there's also a 2-2 two, two flip, right? Is there, if I'm thinking about it properly, is there a reason that you're preferring the 2-3 flip as opposed to a 2-2 two, two flip? We're just showing an example to, to illustrate what okay. flips are. Okay, yeah. I see. It's not like a, you're, you're not declaring a preference. Of oh, no, I'm not showing a preference are. for anything. Just describing what the flip is. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. So in four dimensions, uh, the first is a 1-5 flip. All that is, is you're putting a point at the center of a pentatope and remeshing the tetrahedral facets of that pentatope to that point. This can also be done in reverse, a 5-1 flip. You're removing a point, taking five pentatopes and combining them into one. And that's the uh, vertex decomposition or vertex breakdown between stage one and two or reverse shown on the right in that table. There's also a 3-3 three, three flip and a 2-4 flip. The 2-4 flip can be reversed to a 4-2 flip as well. The reason there's two images shown here and only one image shown here for each is sometimes the 3D projections of these 4D trans transformations look the same in three dimensions because it's just the shadow of what it is in 4D. These are different. You uh, can see the tables here showing how the vertices change. So these are flips that only exist in four dimensions. However, there is something called extended flips, which means essentially you're taking lower dimensional flips and extending them into four dimensions. So an example of that is we talked about the two two flip. You can find that same feature, two neighboring triangles sharing an edge and perform that lower dimensional flip by just switching that edge, switching the diagonal. There are a, a, bunch, a cluster of pentatopes associated with those two triangles. How do you remesh that 
cluster based on performing that lower dimensional play. So those extend into, we've, we've worked out the, uh, um, how that works here and like a 2-2 two -two flip would extend this up into a four dimensional 6-6 six -six flip. We talked about the 2-3 flip that extends into a 4-6 flip in four dimensions. And you can see there's others here. An example of that is a 4-8 extended flip. You have the vertex transformation on the right. We have a 6-6 six -six extended flap, vertex transformation on the right. <clears throat> so how can we use this to improve the quality of a mesh? What we first start off doing is we, we calculate the quality of every element in some mesh that we're considering, just some, some basic mesh we're given. And you sort out that list of quality the quality of every element. Starting with the lowest quality element, you begin looping over your elements. So say we're considering some element. We determine how many flips or what flips out of our list are viable for that element. So how is a flip viable? It's considered viable if the lowest quality element in a cluster, a cluster being, say, we want to do a 6-6 six -six flip containing the element that we're considering. We take those six elements and we find the lowest quality one out of that group and see if it improves. So that gets considered viable if it meets that criteria and the hyper volume of that cluster we're considering does not change. If the hyper volume is changing, it means you're producing an invalid mesh, as in things are crossing, that flip is not viable for the cluster you're considering. So if it meets those two criteria, the flip is valid. You often have multiple flips that are valid for any element that you're considering, element and its neighbors. So how do you, which one do you choose? You determine all possible or viable flips and you find the, the best one, the one that increases the lowest quality element by the most. And once you've performed some flip, say you did six six flip, you freeze the elements associated with that flip that you just did. You don't want to change flips again. So once you have either frozen all of the elements in your mesh or searched all of the elements, they're all either searched or frozen, you end. Battle comes over. So some test cases we performed for this are uh, we're done on randomly generated point, cl point clouds from 50 to 300 points. Uh, this is done, these meshes were generated using the point insertion algorithm we talked about in the previous section. So for each point cloud, again, we, we do what we talked about in the previous slide. We perform valid flips until all elements are either frozen or searched. And how do we determine how successful this algorithm is on the point cloud? How do we judge that? What we, what we did is we calculate the average quality of the worst 10% of the elements in that mesh, or the total number of elements before and after the flips were executed. So moving down to this table to talk about some of these results. So for fifth, you can kind of get an idea of how many flips are done. If we have 50 points, you do 40 flips, then 300 points, we have 528 flips. Uh, you can see here before and after the flips are performed, the hyper volume there, initial and final, those are exactly the same, meaning the mesh did not become invalid. We didn't perform an invalid flip. That's what you want. You don't want the volume of the mesh changing or the hyper volume. Then over on the right, you can see the initial and final average minimum quality of the worst 10% of elements, and we can see that that is increasing. Something I'd like to note is the increase in the average minimum quality, minimum quality isn't something crazy like, wow, that's such a huge increase. This is just to illustrate the usefulness of these flips for future applications. We're just defining these exist and you can use them to improve quality and potentially in the future perform badger recovery. So for future work, we're mainly focused on four-dimensional badger recovery. Talk about what that is now. So this is a very basic illustration to kind of show what we're talking about. Why does badger recovery matter? What's the importance of that? The main uh, 
factor we're considering is maintaining geometric fidelity. We're interested in some shape, some geometry. We want this after we're done meshing, we want the same shape there. We don't want it to change. So a very basic 2D boundary here. Say we want this shape and we mesh everything and we get that. That's our boundary at the end. That's obviously no good. We, we can't have that. So we want the surface mesh we gave it. We want it, we want the same thing after we're done. So to help categorize things, what we have now is called an unconstrained four-dimensional boundary mesh. Unconstrained as in the volume mesh is all there. All the points we want are there. However, the boundary may or may not be there. For very simple shapes, it is. As, you be, as things become more complex, it's often not. So what we're after is called constrained four-dimensional boundary meshing, meaning we have the boundary now. So there's a few different ways of recovering the boundary. There's segment recovery and facet recovery. Those two work hand in hand. They often go together. Segment recovery is just finding an edge of super hypersurface mesh that's missing from the current mesh that you have, and you want to recover that edge. Then there's facet recovery, which is finding a missing tetrahedral facet from your hypersurface mesh that's not in the current mesh that you have. You want to get that back. There's also small polyhedral reconnection, SPR, which we won't be discussing in this presentation. We haven't done much work on that, but we're considering it as an alternative in the future. The main things we're focusing on is segment recovery and facet recovery and using those to cut together to recover the boundary mesh. Uh, just another quick illustration of how that works. In 3D, you could have these, in, this, these input triangles. That's the surface mesh that you want. After you, you get your your volume mesh, you can see that those triangles highlighted in orange are different than what you were expecting. You say, okay, I want to get I want to get the triangles I was expecting. You perform boundary recovery, and there you have everything that you wanted that you were expecting to get. So briefly, we'll talk about what segment recovery is, how you do that, and what fast recovery is. First, it's very important to note that in the process of recovering your boundary, you can be recovering features you lost or you had previously not had while losing other features. So you're recovering a segment over here, but in the process of remeshing, you lose a segment over here. So you have to be careful. Oh, one way of doing that is you find tetrahedral facets from your hypersurface mesh that exists in the mesh that you currently have. So you say, I don't want to change this feature. This is what I want. You freeze those elements. Don't let them change. So from the elements that are not frozen, you'll begin working with those to recover um, segments of facets that you want. So for segment recovery, you find a missing edge that you want to recover, and you insert a point along that missing edge. Where you insert it along that edge is a determined by criteria that Hong C developed in one of his papers. We won't go into detail on that, but it's that's how we determined it. It's very good. <clears throat> so once you insert that point, just using the point insertion algorithm we talked about, that or the, the two pieces of that edge should be recovered. There's a point there now, but the two pieces should be there. If, if that's not recovered, those two pieces of that edge, you can just adjust where that point is located, and you should be able to recover that edge. <clears throat> so for facet recovery, again, you want to freeze the features that you know are correct. Uh, freeze the elements associated with the tetrahedral facets that from your hypersurface mesh that you know are correct. So those are frozen, and you want to select a missing facet you want to recover. This is a bit different. You don't just use one facet. There could be neighboring facets that are also unrecovered that you don't have. So what you can do is you identify all of the neighboring facets that are also unrecovered, and that creates a missing region of tetrahedral facets. So once you've identified this missing region, you find all of the nearby pentatopes with the edges that cross the missing region you just identified. Once you identify those pentatopes, that creates a cavity, a cavity of pentatopes with edges that cross your missing region. That cavity that you've identified can be split into top and bottom cavities split by the missing region. And those top and bottom cavities, the points associated with those are put into separate subspaces in each mesh, three mesh. 
and you should recover. If you've done this correctly, you should recover the features that you want in those separate subspaces. If you do, you can remesh that cavity according to those two subspaces, and you should recover the tetrahedral facets you were missing. Like it? Yeah. You're just nodding. I'm like, what? Yeah, no. I'm like nodding because I'm also like, yeah, I, I, we know all the ways that I can go wrong. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is yeah. the idea. Yeah. That is the idea behind it. Yeah. So one of the main challenges that we're currently dealing with is um, intersection checks in four dimensions. Intersection checks compound in higher dimensions. You don't do a 4D intersection check and that's it. So say we're interested in seeing if a certain line crosses our missing region. And we're going to say, OK, does this line cross this tetrahedral facet? You do your four dimensional line tech intersection check, which we have. If it does not intersect, you don't just move on. You say, OK, is this hypercoplanar with any of the triangles associated with the tetrahedron that you're considering there? If it is hypercoplanar, you have to check, do a four dimensional line triangle intersection check, which I'd like to specify is different than three dimensional line triangle intersection check. And it's an, entire, it's an entirely different check. So you, you can't. It's kind of upsetting because you can't reuse the intersection checks from lower dimensions. You have to make a new one. So you say, OK, does it cross this triangle? If it does not, you're not done yet. You have to check if that line is coplanar with any of the other lines of that triangle. If it is four dimensionally coplanar with one of those lines, you have to perform a four dimensional line line intersection check. As I'm sure you can imagine, a four dimensional line line intersection check there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with precision there. So there's compounding intersection checks when determining the cavity for a missing region, and there's arbitrary precision, potential arbitrary precision associated with that. So those are some of the things we're dealing with as we're getting facet recovery working in four dimensions. So just a quick summary. What we have completed is a method for creating four-dimensional hypersurfaces, um, four-dimensional space-time hypersurfaces, um, and unconstrained 4D hypervolume meshing techniques. We're currently working on constrained four-dimensional hypervolume meshing, meaning boundary recovery. Um, in the future, we'd like to be working on mesh adaptivity and data structures in four dimensions. Some of our references and. Any questions? Five minutes for questions. Any questions? Uh, uh, I had a long question. So, uh, throughout this uh, talk, I was wondering how we, so there is a lot of calculation, manipulation, how the data structure is going to you know, handle all those. It looks like a complex task. Yes. 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 And okay, like we scale it or like parallelize it. Uh, so, it looks very complicated. Yeah. What, uh, what we currently if have. If you yeah. consider the performance, because everything comes yeah. down to the performance. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, you're completely right. I, I agree with you. That's something we're we're currently working on proof of concept, showing that this works, and optimize optimization would be um, something in the future. Yeah. Just finding the neighbors of any pentatope you're considering is very complex. How do you yeah. store? For each pentatope, knowing what neighbor, what's neighboring that pentatope, um, and you get these very large data structures that keep getting bigger as your mesh is getting bigger, and it, it's it, it gets difficult. Okay. What we're currently using is a uh, vertex pentatope data structure. So for every vertex, we know all of the pentatopes associated with that vertex, and that's been a bit faster than just saying this pentatope has five five neighbors and here they are. Um, but yeah, th that's right. It's that's something we're working on. Yeah, there's a uh, good grout work on this topic that's already been done. So and you're probably familiar with half edge data structure for meshing, but they do have half facet data structures that were like developed in the mid 2010s, like 2013 timeframe uh, by some guys at one of the national labs. I think it was at Livingport. And so the capacity to be able to do this in 4D, it's, it's there. Uh, we would need to actually implement our algorithms in that framework. Right. Which we have yet to do, um, but it is it is something that we're we're planning on doing. Uh, for the 
parallelization piece, which you mentioned. Uh, so that's just a matter of doing uh, domain decomposition, right? Uh, which is like kind of the only way to parallelize the body mm -hmm. that I'm aware of, at least. There's, maybe there's some others, but I haven't seen them. Um, and so there's good approaches for that that have been demonstrated in 3D, and it's a matter of extending those into 4D. Okay. Which is, I mean, you know, kind of basically what our job is, like they, taking 3D ideas that already exist and then figuring out how to make them work before. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, any other question? Two minutes. Any question from online? One more question. So uh, <laughs> this is still uh, in the developmental stage, right? So you don't actually like put those in a, like a existing heat sol uh, solver, right? We there is a Navy solver that we use, and this is available to be used in that, but it's still we'd consider it developmental. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I have a question. You have three courses to define the quality of the grain. Yeah. I'm just wondering, do you have a lot more what's the criteria you think is a low quality mesh? A criteria for determining what, what, what is the what was the low quality? The what the grid quality is low. Oh, for using these metrics to determine if the grid quality is low? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like yeah. He's like, if your average mesh quality was like 0.5 versus 0.75, like what's what we consider good? Right. Well, that's something we haven't considered yet. <laughs> We're just trying to get it to work. <laughs> yeah. 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 So basically, the answer is as high quality as we can make it. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, but point. yeah, we our standards are. are shift from problem to problem. Basically. Yeah. 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 Because I think you know, like to like 50, 400. Uh, flips, so you increase from real point two to real point two two. Is it enough, or you want to do more, or you just start? Uh, it's it's not a large increase in quality. It's just yeah. a point of concept. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree with you. That's not a large increase. But if if the CFD solver is robust enough, the quality doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. That is that is the the problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's time. It's noon. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, everyone. Thank you all for your attention to your questions. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.